so I've been trying to figure out whether or not I should create this video uh, I still don't really know <laughs> so if it's up <laughs> I guess I did it and part of the reason is because it's such a sensitive subject and it's sensitive because it's experienced so many different ways by so many different people it's experienced by those who are left behind with absolutely no clue or understanding of why and all the guilt and betrayal and anger a lot of anger anger so much anger that comes up afterwards denial prior um, I think that's probably why the anger comes up it's because you start hearing information and you can't deny you can't deny your own denial anymore and instead of getting mad at yourself you then get mad at someone else the people that were involved in the situation from the person who actually either tried or was successful in their completion of there's a whole other spectrum that most people don't get. And it's not true that everyone leaves a letter. And the other thing is that no two people experience it identically. And, and also, the root cause of what drives or propels a person to the enactment and especially the completion is going to be very different for everyone. So today I'm going to share my personal stories. I'm someone that I've experienced the completion of suicide in my family. I have attempted to complete suicide in my own life. God intervened in that one. Or something did. I don't know if I want to talk about this. It's interesting but that I find myself kind of holed up in this room. I'm not out hiking or biking or walking or gardening or any of that. The places where I know are good for me. But they're also a way of escaping. And I think I'm done. I think I'm done escaping. I think that's why I'm kind of content to sit in it, to become intimate with it, the way it thinks and feels. Maybe try and understand the why. Hiking, outdoor gardening, and, and indoor houseplants, and pets all have one thing in common. They're nature through the natural world. Outdoor gardening is and has always been my one of my happy places. Playing in the dirt, even in the, playing in the sandbox as a kid, it was one of my happy places. Catching worms, catching frogs with my bare hands, being knee or waist deep in swamp water. But outdoor gardening is uh, its a little too short-lived and a little too seasonal where I live in Zone 5. So house plants, right? But unless I go winter hiking, which I do love, I truly enjoy doing, uh, if I get indoors a little too long, I don't always know what triggers it but something does. Maybe it's lack of sunlight, lack of vitamin D. 
I, I don't think this is just emotion affecting mind. I do think that there is a biochemical reaction in the body, brain and body. And I do think it has a lot to do with hormones and the vitamins and minerals that go into the functioning of those hormones. And so seasonal affective disorder, definitely something that I've experienced throughout life. Most of the time it's manageable. I know enough to get out and walk on the bright sunny, even if they're bitter cold, bright sunny days in the winter. You just have to dress for the weather. It's, that's what I've learned here. As a kid, I, I learned that the hard way because, I don't know, somewhere in my mind, I just lived for summer and long days and warm days. And in the winter, I guess when I was younger, my mom would struggle with me for a little bit to put on my hat and my coat and my boots. And I just wanted to be outdoors. I didn't care if I was in my underwear. <laughs> I just wanted to be outdoors. And I guess sometimes I would go out not dressed properly and you know I'd suddenly realize I'm cold and then I'd run indoors and I'd bundle up and I just I had to learn through the experience of cold the value of warmth the value of clothing that provide that warmth um, so yeah so long as I can get outdoors in the winter I'm I'm okay, whether I'm driving outdoors or hiking or walking, it doesn't matter, it's just as long as I'm outdoors in the winter, it's, it's good for me. It's probably why I like snowmobiling and walking, trudging up, you know, again, depending on the what the climate was, whether I was walking on ice because everything had rained and froze, or I grew up in the country, so the fields literally turned to ice, and then you'd step on them and you'd Eventually, you'd hit a thin patch of ice and you'd crunch down through the snow. And that could go up anywhere from knee to hip, hip height, I guess. There was a lot more snow as a child. I remember that growing up than there is today, where I live anyway. I don't know about the rest of the world. There's definitely less snow. The world's changing. The climate's changing. Are we contributing? Maybe, but I think the world is always just changing anyway. You know, how could have man possibly affected the Ice Age? We weren't here. Or if we were, we weren't with all the technology that we claim is causing climate change. So I think the Earth has its own climate change. And yeah, we can contribute to accelerating that and, and also perhaps even delaying it. But I think inevitably, the Earth is its own consciousness. If I don't get out a lot in the winter time, uh, I think that's why I put so much emphasis on spring to autumn. It's, why, it's almost like I live for it. I get really sad after June 21st, which is the longest day of the year, and most people get happy, but because I already know that the daylight hours are starting to dwindle, so I start going into depression basically from that point on until December 21st. And then I know the days get longer. But I'm not seeing the days getting longer until about February. February, March, and that's when I start getting antsy and I start climbing the walls and I need out. I just need to get that F out in nature. No, I, I, yeah, in nature. But if I don't have that, then house plants aren't enough. If I do have the outdoor winter activities, then my pets and my house plants are enough. And my life is enough. My indoors are enough. Preparing food and, and just spending time with Dawn watching movies or spending time doing a crossword puzzle, that can all be enough for me. <clears throat> I'd like to say that work is enough for me. The work that I do for myself is to some, well, it's the most that I've ever experienced working for other people now. Working for other people has always been a death sentence for me. 
and it's because there's too many restrictions. For me, I need to be a real bee. I need to go from flower to flower, from task to task, um, from different species of flower to different species of flower. So from, you know, not just tasks within a particular job because that's too restrictive. I let me dabble in all sorts of different things because I have this affinity to learn really fast and I see things and I'm a problem finder and a problem solver and and a possibility generator and there's a lot of entertainment in that that keeps depression at bay but when I'm just to do secretarial answering phones typing letters or if I'm just to do driving people from destination to destination when the when the task is so repetitively mundane and you're not doing it for your life you know that you're there just to collect a paycheck you're not doing it for your life you're doing it to benefit other people's lives and so it becomes hollow and if you can make friends at work, then that makes it a little better. And when that doesn't work and there's a deeper craving, maybe you get into sexual affairs at work or maybe you get extremely competitive against coworkers in one way, shape, form or another, whether it's for a promotion or whether it's just because you can't stand them because Or they can't stand you because they're kind of in the same energy. They just need something to fight against because fighting against even the worst thing is there's life in that. There's energy at least. Because when depression gets really bad, there's not even that. There's not even energy. That's when you just sleep. I'm not there. I don't think I'll be there. I don't think I'll be there this time because, as I keep saying, this is a very different experience for me. Yeah, houseplants and pets and indoor life that normally... The things that you create in your inner environment, your home, your sacred space, is normally enough. Uh, but when you get, even for low-grade depression, it's, it's still enough. But when you get into that deeper depression, it's, it's not enough. The, the void is just, it's too vast. And you're spiraling and you're free-falling. It's definitely not enough when you once you've hit the bottom. I mean, because there's nothing there. Absolutely nothing but darkness and heaviness. It's when you hit the bottom that you start initiating, scheming, strategizing your suicide plan. Because that seems like it's the only right choice in the moment. I'm not in that energy, space, and consciousness today, thank God. Uh, instead, I feel the weight of the depression. But I'm also very aware in a way that I've never been, and so I'm looking at life in a different way and as a result in spite of all the heaviness and the pushing up against me and the suffocation of this energy I'm in gratitude I'm in gratitude of all the little daily things that normally irritate the fuck out of me you know the cats meowing coming in and out and dog coming in and out and noise in the neighborhood and neighbors and today I'm in gratitude of all of it because it's helping me to stay here. It's helping me to stay present. It's taking the focus off 
me, I guess. It's, it's, I don't have a reason to live that I'm aware of. But this is giving me a reason to live. It's the way it feels. Maybe that's the story I'm telling myself. grateful to sweep in my floors today because as much as I like barefoot hiking in nature, I don't like barefoot hiking in my own home. I don't like feeling dirt in my home. Even in that, I guess I'm grateful for my need for cleanliness and even to the point when I'm looking back to the last time I was in this energy when I was 28, 29, I was OCD. I had to be. I had to super focus on the dirt because it was only the dirt, the dust, that kept me alive. There was nothing else. Jobs, relationships, even my own daughter. Nothing could keep me alive in that moment. So I just focused on all the dirt. And that gave me the energy to clean. It gave me energy. And the only thing I knew to do with that energy was to clean. But there's movement in that. And there's energy in that. And there's life in that. And at that time, it was enough. It got me through it. Well, that and drugs and sex and work and a bunch of other stuff. But when all that other stuff failed, it was that's when OCD really kicked in high gear and like I said, that's what saved me. I'm grateful because even though I still feel all this compression, tightness, lack of mobility, that depression, and even isolation, this is all depression. My mind has a flicker of light to, to look at, to lock onto. It's like a dristy point in yoga. The gratitude for the daily irritations of life. So why interpretive dance? Uh, first of all, it's a really good workout. <laughs> and you don't need a lot of space in your home, so it's a good way to take care of your body. Music is incredibly therapeutic, regardless of what kind of music it is. It can alter the consciousness of your body, which in turn kind of wakes you up. <laughs> so listening to music can have a healing effect. Movement purges or detoxifies stuck energies regardless of what they are. Interpretive dance, it's your body showing you what it remembers, what it knows. And if you're going to be in judgment of that, you might be missing the subtle cues. The body is its own consciousness, the body remembers. The body even remembers how to live. <laughs> so interpretive dance is letting the body guide you without judgment. And even if you find yourself later in judgment, there's still a part of your body's energies that shifted and changed. And therefore, somewhere in your consciousness and emotions, you've shifted and changed too. And I don't know about you, but I will take every nth of a percentage <laughs> to make up a whole percentage. If it means, if you know anything about flight patterns, one degree can be like four or 500 miles off, right? From where you are headed, which is more of where you are now. So that's, I guess, for me, <laughs> why, without knowing, just trusting, I agreed to do this interpretive dance and kind of reawaken to the healing aspects of it, which is kind of cool. 